I'm Saina. I'm from Let's Venture. And uh, we are hosting this uh, session, which we are calling the Silver Linings Playbook for our investors as well as for founders on our platform and outside. Uh, the aim of this uh, session is actually to understand, uh, go a little deeper into what we are hearing as headlines, correct? Uh, why are the markets behaving the way they are? Uh, what can we expect to see both in the public as, as well as private markets uh, in the next couple of quarters? And with Gautam, of course, because of his experience and uh, the depths that he goes into in the financials and fintech space, that's going to be a focus of conversation here today. So what is the impact of uh, certain uh, federal bank measures here in India as well as outside? What impact is that going to have? What is the RBI moratorium on banks, for instance? What is that going to mean? Uh, are we looking at a credit free freeze uh, down the line? And what impact will that have on businesses, big and small? Uh, for the financials that are listed and in the public space, uh, those repercussions are perhaps easier to track in the private space. A lot of players that have uh, literally raised hundreds of millions of dollars in doing what I think uh, Gautam put in one of his blogs as Kirana Tech. Uh, a large part of uh, actually involved funding of bringing financial products to that part of the market. What impact is going to, what impact are we going to see over there? Correct. So those are the things that we're going to talk about. Just a little bit of an introduction to uh, Gautam. Gautam is uh, presently the director of uh, looking at financials and fintech for India at Sanford Bernstein in Singapore. Uh, prior to this, uh, he was with CDC and with uh, Matrix Partners, which is uh, a large VC firm here in India and globally as well. So that's a little bit of his background. So I'm going to get right into it, uh, Gautam. Thanks very much for joining us. Let's just start with the high level stuff, right? At sure. the, Thanks for hosting me. Yes. At the very top, Gautam, what are you seeing in terms of the impact that uh, COVID is having on uh, the public market, uh, the stock markets, not just here in India, but globally. Perhaps you want to bring in a little bit of a view on what's happening in China and the rest of Asia yeah, as well yeah. in this space and give us yeah. a sense of where yeah. you see uh, the bottom coming. I know it's like catching a uh, dropping, but uh, what is your own sense of uh, what we should make of the market? Yeah, so, you know, before uh, we get into the market, right, I mean, See, I mean, fundamentally, one should, uh, you know, I think we quickly move into, uh, you know, when we start talking about COVID, we quickly move into the economics and how it's having an economic impact. But it, it kind of makes sense to take a step back and actually understand this phenomenon. Uh, and, and when people kind of, when you put that in context, then you're able to relate to the markets better because I think that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's been the big difference in which uh, one should approach this space. So if you look at the the physical phenomenon, you know, this is a biological physical phenomenon. Uh, you know, the way I look at it is it's here, it's viral. I mean, you know, in startup world, we call it viral growth. It's, it's viral, but it's sort of harming us in a very viral, sort of growing very exponentially. Uh, and, and at the same time, every nation is building a strategy around it. Uh, but essentially the strategy is, are very common and similar, uh, except there are certain nuances with China, US, India, and sort of other, other European markets. Uh, so if you look at how it happened in 1918, we just had one strategy then, which was quarantine. Uh, if you look at 2020, we just have one strategy, which is quarantine. Uh, because essentially we still haven't figured out uh, how, to, how to kind of uh, one sort of how to reduce, how to cure it because there's no certainty or certain probability of cure. I mean, there are chances where chloroquine is working or remesvir is working, uh, but there's nothing clinically proven. But obviously as a caution, we are using medicines that, we, that, are, that, are, that are using, that, that, that are working. Uh, and then if you, so essentially all nations are going in lockdown at different stages. If you look at Singapore, where I was now, I'm in Mumbai, uh, they said they're going to keep it running for some time. Uh, and they kept on running for some time. And towards the end of it, they realized that this is not manageable. They have to go under lockdown. So now Singapore implemented a late lockdown when they felt that this was not convert. They were not able to handle it. If you look at China, it happened in Wuhan. Their first strategy was to take Wuhan and the surrounding provinces and completely put 
circles around it, right? Completely put hard boundaries around it so that the big cities, Beijing, Shanghai, and the other economic parts of China don't get impacted. So China, what it did really well, it locked down very quickly. It, it made sure the rest of China is not impacted. So you see it coming out of it, sort of coming out of it now, right? Where Wuhan, the lockdown has been lifted. Beijing, you know, it's still under restriction, but you know, you, you see people on the street and things like that. So everyone is now putting their angst on China. Look, they gave it to us, but, uh, but it's all strategy, right? It's not about whether they gave it to us. And the, I mean, the strategy was to lock down immediately, not delay it like Singapore. Uh, and sort of make sure that the rest of the parts are less impacted. And now that they've done that, they have broken that virality that I was talking about. And it's kind of reached a stage where they think they can manage it. So my view on this is that all nations will reach a point where they will start managing it because we have to live with it until the vaccine is here. Uh, and, uh, and, and, that's, and that's the difference. So if you look at U.S., they had, they had warnings. They, they didn't block their borders enough. India has been more stringent. U.S. messed it up and, so, and then eventually had to go into lockdown. But now they are figuring out how to get out of this whole lockdown and get to some level of management. If you look at India, we were super humble about our capabilities. We know we don't have the healthcare capacity. So we completely went lockdown, very stringent on the economy. Uh, but again, we can't have livelihoods impacted. So we'll have to get out of this and then again start managing. So one view I want to give everyone over the next six, 12 months, I don't know where medical science goes and how quickly we get the vaccine and then getting it to production and so on and so forth. We will have to get a, a, a way of managing it either through red zones, green zones, either through uh, technology using apps, either through bands where we know who's if impacted, who's, who's not. I mean, we, every nation will have to come up with techniques and methods to kind of you know, deal with it. In India, we'll have to come up with their own method which works for us. So every nation will have their own strategy and the strategy is to manage because the first strategy is to lock down and the second strategy is to manage. So moving sort of to the, to the, to the markets, right? I mean, if you look at this as a situation right now, this clearly has immediate acute impact on businesses because you're under lockdown. That is obvious. And I think that the markets have digested. So the first sharp correction you saw was around this whole point that, oh, damn, we are going to contract our GDP. Oh, we're not going to grow, uh, especially nations which are growing, right? I think the second leg of this market impact is going to be around what is the slow digestion process around each of the businesses getting impacted from retail to auto to SMEs to consumer uh, and sort of the whole space. So I think what you want to see over the next nine, 12 months is sort of slow digestion. So you still got that sharp acute correction and the rally back. And now you're going to see is like a, steady so i don't know whether it'll be steady but you can call it a bear market but it'll be in pockets right there are obviously you're seeing some pockets where technology and pharma is working so market is now starting to look beyond this period and saying that which are the businesses which are going to have a long-term future so for example you know the technology we are using right now zoom people say that this became from an enterprise company to a consumer company because now all of us are using it so markets are sort of forward looking in that aspect so be it technology, which has sort of positive cash flow, low leverage businesses. If you look at uh, if you look at pharma and healthcare, obviously those are natural thematics that are arising from this. Uh, and then if you obviously look at our sector, which is financial services and and fintech, wherever there's leverage, you know you're carrying levered balance sheets. So if as soon as you slow down the flow, because it's a flow business, as soon as you slow down the flow, because you know a lot of the leverage balance sheets are managed on flow. Uh, so once the flow is stopped you start to see the back book delinquencies, you start to see the challenges around, you know, asset quality, you start to see challenges around liquidity, because again, it's a flow business, right? The money comes in and the money goes out. So I think that's why, you know, this particular sector has been under a challenge. So you see the sector has, not, has even though it corrected, it's not bouncing back that quickly. And the reason for that is you don't want to be owning leverage when you're going to go through this slow economic contraction process. No, you know, I don't want to get into those descriptions of whether there's a depression or so on and so forth. Because you know, the last time we had a depression, we didn't have economic stimulus. Uh, but now we have trillions of dollars of money that's getting printed, right? So, so that's so that's that's the other thing. The last thing I'll say is around economic stimulus. And one country is at a clear advantage here is which is US, which actually has messed up the whole COVID management, has the maximum number of cases now, uh, but it has the US dollar, uh, which is the reserve currency of the world. So they can print US dollar. They said we have infinite capacity to print the dollar. 
uh, you can imagine if 22 trillion dollar economy they printed they're going to print they're saying 6 trillion dollar stimulus yesterday they shipped uh, they you know uh, credited 1200 dollars uh, in uh, everyone's bank account so us can print unlimited stimulus without worrying about its currency because it's a reserve currency of the world what it does to other currencies we can see where the rupee is today uh, it's lost 10% uh, and uh, and similar even australian dollar is down to us so it's going to damage other currencies of the world but it will print dollars and it will save itself it'll, in in the attempt to try to save the economy or sort of soften the damage i mean the damage is done but soften the damage uh, and obviously if india does that in, and which they are talking about the monetizing the fiscal deficit uh, you will obviously see pressure on the rupee again because you know the purchasing power of the rupee gets impacted so i think every nation is at a different point in time india just can't start printing rupees and distribute it to everyone you know when we'll have uh, you know 1 1 will be equal to 500 rupees uh, so you don't want that kind of a situation as well so you have to be balanced and careful which the government is doing so i think that's and that's why you're seeing the market being a bit disappointed with the indian government and the rbi with stimulus and so on and so forth so that's the overall global context and how things are evolving all right uh, so that was the global context got i might just one question on that is to so we've established that right now we are actually in a deep uh, economic crisis right which is on uh, on ground it's impacting all of the large and small uh, businesses because everything has just come to a stand standstill right uh, large parts of the economy uh, travel hospitality sector even manufacturing to a large extent uh, banking all of that on hold at what point even when we do start managing the situation and start uh, you know kind of reopening uh, the main uh, real economy do you think that uh, we might see the beginnings of a financial uh, crisis i think that was something that you were alluding to just want to get into that a little bit and try and think of at what point if at all our large financial structures the banks both public and private were to start crumbling like we saw in 2008 uh, due to a subprime lending crisis do you see the makings of that uh, happening now given the kind of uh, loan books that people are sitting at the levels of npas here in india is there a trigger for a larger financial crisis to start uh, ruminating or do you think that's just far too pessimistic no i wouldn't call it a financial i mean economic crisis or sort of physical economical crisis to a financial crisis i think you will see pockets of weakness and i think what you are seeing now is uh, the segments which are exposed to it real estate retail uh, you saw the news on futures future uh, group today uh, you will see people kind of coming out and say hey look i can't carry my debt so the trend you were seeing on the corporate side which is around corporate restructuring corporate failures bankruptcy i think that trend is going to continue potentially accelerate uh, especially with the segments that are getting impacted because you need to restructure the debt uh, and you need to even restructure the good debt right i mean things that you considered good pre covid uh, right. i think, you think our banking sector has the appetite to uh, consume all of that consume all of that possibly and at what point yeah, sure it it's a function of what rbi does right so the moratorium right now is 3 months uh, so can you take the moratorium to more than that uh, if if the banks are restructuring and that involves credit costs uh, can the rbi give them exemption to recognize that on their pnl considering this as a special situation uh, right. so obviously i think rbi will do everything possible to prevent a financial crisis i think one thing you can be sure of i mean whatever the banks need from the regulator they're going to get it uh and uh they will kind of go reach out to the regulator to ask for all kind of exemptions uh now there is a limit to that but at least the front running or the front line financial banks and financial organization and banks in the country uh they're going to get all the support now obviously there are segments which are like nbfcs uh there are fintechs who do lending business which are also like nbfcs uh, except that they use technology uh and uh, so obviously there are segments like that where they will have asset quality pressures with their customers but the banks are obviously not giving them the reply when that's an issue being considered uh which will involve them lobbying with the rbi and coming back so i think for the marginal financial services obviously the situation looks quite uh challenging uh 
uh, and it, it becomes a question of survival, managing liquidity, and all the all the good things, uh, all the things that you need to do in a situation like that. All right. Okay. So I'm going to start taking some questions, Gautam, and we can circle back uh, to some parts of this conversation, sure. especially on the fintechs in the private market and the startup space, right? And the repercussions over there. So I'm going to take one question that's come in from uh, Pradeep, who is a co-founder of a company called Crime Check. And he says that we give our legal risk report to banks and NBFCs and our revenue depends on new loan accounts. What would be the impact on number of new loan accounts uh, being opened? in the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Pradeep, what we'll see here is that uh, for the next three months is obviously an economic freeze because of the moratorium. Uh, my expectation is the next quarter will be digestion of that whole moratorium because now uh, what's happening is all the existing bank accounts like retail loans, personal loans, credit cards, all, all retail loans, uh, SMEs, they're all sort of at different stages, right? Some are seeking moratorium, some are not paying, but have not seek, seek you know, have not uh, obtained the moratorium. So banks are gonna digest that over the next three months in the second quarter. I think it's only in potentially by the third quarter, which is uh, sort of uh, the September to December quarter is when you'll see some kind of loan growth come back uh, is what my expectation is. Uh, Again, it depends on how bad the situation gets. It's quite fluid right now. So if it gets really bad on retail, uh, I'm talking sort of double digit NPAs. I'm not saying that's coming, but yeah. uh, I'm just saying if you get to that kind of a scenario, uh, you will see potentially even longer that the loan accounts and the new disbursals get impacted. So it's a fluid situation. At the minimum, you should assume that six months are kind of slow or wiped out. And then the next six months, one can be hopeful. Uh, but it will come slowly and gradually. Maybe, obviously, it may be because of the festival season, there'll be demand, but uh, uh, expect, expect it to be sort of, uh, uh, depending on the asset quality situation, we'll have to kind of take a call. All right. Uh, Dinesh is asking, how will this play out uh, in the coming quarters in India? Okay, so we've covered that. Uh, in the Indian uh, public equity market, is the bottom behind us or yet to come? <laughs> so I think the sharp bottom is behind us, uh, mm -hmm. which is that one vertical fall. Uh, now you will see sort of sideways gliding down kind of movement is what my sense is. Uh, obviously, there'll be spikes. So it's going to be a whipsaw. So if there's a policy announcement, there's a stimulus, the market will jump, uh, which is a classic bear market whipsaw you'll see. Uh, and then if you see, uh, if you see bad results, because now we'll have to start digesting no growth, zero growth, negative growth, uh, yeah. all those kind of headlines that will come about. Uh, so you'll see market reacting to that. So expect six months of very choppy market, uh, th at least three months of very choppy market. And uh, individual sector bottoms will be driven by when, when the sort of the, how the sectors behave. So uh, I, my views are out there in the press. So I'd say at least, uh, uh, I, I don't think the financial sector has seen a bottom. Uh, that's that. my that's my view. I could be wrong. Okay, so talking about the financial sector, okay, I'm going to refer to uh, that HDFC report, right? Uh, don't want to talk about the bank in particular per se, but just an observation that I pulled out from there, right? Which is one of the reasons why you, uh, why Sanford Bernstein actually downgraded. Uh, the company to an underperform was that there was a lot of unsecured consumer risk in a maturing consumer cycle, and that 80% of the uh, loans were actually an unsecured book to the salaried uh, class, right? What impact, I mean, now job cuts have become real, salary cuts have become far too real, uh, correct, at least, if not the job cuts yet. Uh, what impact will that have, right? The great middle class that is holding up a lot of everything in our economy, the banking sector, uh, you know, the taxes that we pay and that's churned around, it's a small, small sliver, but you know the great Indian middle. What impact is it going to have, and therefore the impact on uh, you know just NPAs? So corporate NPA and all of that, I think, is easier to understand. But what starts happening when folks like me start defaulting on loan payments? Right, that eighty percent that was holding up an unsecured book. What happens to that? Yeah, so uh, Saina, I think uh, the way, you know, Indian middle class is a hundred year story. I mean, I think that that 
you can't i mean given the demographics that will always continue but what happens is every few years right every few years we start overestimating the size of the market uh and when we do that we end up sort of touching pockets uh which are sort of less credit worthy than sort of than what we thought uh so at the top of the cycle uh which in hindsight we can now say we potentially were at the top of the cycle last year uh we start touching segments which potentially maybe on the edge in terms of leverage uh maybe uh not as well placed in terms of job security uh and then sort of you know black swans or you know un- uh, unfortunate incidents like that could just flip certain people over uh because look i mean majority of people should be comfortable but then obviously there are always people on the edge who may have taken a loan uh and may flip things over so i think that's where we are getting to i think we are in a zone where we are not certain that's going to happen but the signs are there uh the the job cuts you spoke about the salary uh, reduction the sal- potential headcount cuts down the line uh you know retrenchments and things like that which i hope doesn't happen but mm-hmm. if we get there then there is an edge you know then what we call the salaried super safe segment may also look a bit a bit vulnerable uh again i i hope we don't get there uh i think the 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 other point is that we've had a very long there's this dichotomy which has gone on in the market for the last 3 4 years which is like hey our corporates are super weak they're doing their defaulting to the banks and our households are keeping up right and it can go on for some time it can be a temporary phase of 3 4 years where you will see that the the jobs are protected but the corporates are not doing a profitable right and maybe and banks can kind of avoid these landmines right look if x corporate is going to go down so i'm not going to give any loans to its employees uh, mm. but now we are in a situation where you don't know where the landmine is yeah uh, and uh, and i think that's what's the other thing which is going to happen is this dichotomy is going to go away and it's going to converge where the household destinies are also linked to the corporate destinies because they're the same people who work in the same organizations right right uh, and i think that will make the environment more challenging so we'll see where the delinquencies go i don't want to be speculative or fear monger on that uh that was not that has not never been my sort of intention around that but uh in, it's important to recognize that the environment has changed where the corporate destinies will impact households and then you can't just go about lending to households the way, same way in which you did and i think that changes and that's why the whole banking sector starts to look a bit different okay and just a, a point extension from your is a lot of the fintechs that we saw come up right in the private space so the startups now i'm talking about in the last year year and a half were the folks that were saying hey you know it either we've got great ways which are tech enabled to track consumer credit histories and give out uh, so that banks can make better loans or we ourselves are going to be now going to be tracking small traders small businesses or uh, look at their credit histories on the amazons flipkarts of the world and give them uh, debt or loan whatever you might want to call it yeah that quasi nbfc uh, structuring that was yeah. happening a lot of large very very well funded uh, fintechs correct the view seen this place space close up in front uh, when you were with matrix uh, and even now you track this so tell us what you will see happening in that space right where what are the big big challenges coming up and what are the opportunities see i mean this is what happens right bull market versus bear market uh bull market every financial services business thinks of itself as a tech platform bear market they just realize they are a balance sheet uh, yeah. uh and and i think you know i am a huge believer in fintech actually uh yeah. but except that except that when you are a lending fintech and you're doing consumer loans uh one needs to realize that you're looking at segments which are being avoided by the banks and same with nbfcs they look at segments which are avoided by the banks so the kind of backstop risk management one needs to practice there uh be it around leverage your own balance sheet leverage your own uh uh and sort of uh, you know the kind of loss ratios that you've built in in your models uh and the speed at which you grow right because everything is momentum and then when momentum slows it gets hurt so my sense is I think fintech has a great future. I think lending fintechs just have to navigate the environment and we realize that they are in a cyclical business and there'll be periods where the shopkeepers will not pay. Uh 
uh, there'll be events where things like that, right? Uh, and there could be events where people who bought uh, iPhones or mobile phones online uh, with uh, their uh, uh, with 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 their online tech fintech yeah. platforms, uh, they will have defaults. Uh, so my sense is, I mean, you, again, you look at microfinance, right? It's always prepared for defaults along somewhere down the line, right? Because every two, three years, something or the other happens. So the business model needs to be built in a way that you should expect that bad things will happen if you're a lending fintech. And you should be able to bounce off that with excess liquidity and things like that. So you can't be always, if you're running a business like that on the lending side, you can't be always on the edge. You can't be waiting for your next fundraise. You can't be, you always need to have buffer. Uh, so whichever fintechs have managed it well or in a position to raise or have the credibility to raise capital uh, at this time or have already raised capital recently should survive and play the second innings because it's always about the second innings now. You know, one innings, you know, we've had one phase which has gotten over. You need to have the capital. You need to have the liquidity to manage, and so that you are you survive uh, to play the second inning. Then you don't don't be in a hurry to uh, execute or defend valuations or uh, defend uh, or or try to you know even if you de if you don't grow this year uh, and your revenues go by half, it's okay so long as you survive. Revenues go by half. That that's really optimistic. Yeah, I mean if the if the loan book if the loan book contracts the revenues contract right so no i'm saying that even by half is very optimistic gautam i mean that is that i, yeah. I don't think it's in yeah. my place i don't know the individual cases yeah, but uh, my sense is uh, you will see you will have to i mean how do you manage liquidity right you manage liquidity by collecting your money and if you don't get liabilities then you know you're able to kind of still maintain some kind of a loan book and still honor your liabilities and that's how you have to contract so I've seen this cycle before with NBFCs and fintechs in 2008, 2013. There are periods where you have to con where you have to shrink to survive, okay. uh, and that's okay. I think that's that's fine because you can play you can play the next innings. All right. Okay. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions. Uh, uh, so this one's coming in from Nikhil, who says that I would like your take on specifics in this priority order, uh, unsecured yeah. loan book. Uh, vehicle financing, MSME, uh, LAP, uh, and then tri uh, triple V plus corporate loan book. Yeah, you want me to? Uh... He would like uh, how you would prioritize these. Uh, I know Nikhil, if you're on, you want to just ask this question uh, so that we're able to understand what exactly you want out of this. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I okay. think I kind of get what he's, what yeah. he's trying to imply. Uh, so I think, uh, Nikhil, I think it's very simple, right? I mean, it's secured to unsecured. Uh, so obviously, unsecured is challenging, uh, but unsecured is small ticket. Uh, so it's potentially easier to collect that money. Secured is higher ticket, uh, and maybe just harder given the scale of the of the of the loan. Uh, but also bear in mind that secured doesn't mean full. Secure doesn't mean security because the value of the security can fluctuate, right? So if you try and sell a real estate property now, what's the value you're going to get? Uh, and, uh, and, and that being the case, and, and plus there, there may not be any liquidity for the collateral. Uh, so which is why uh, it's, it's, uh, it is case by case. So if you look at LAP, you, it may look like secured, but you may not be able to sell the property. Uh, if you look at SME, you look, it may be certain, security around their inventory, around certain things. Uh, the valuation of that may be inflated, valuation of that may go down. So all in all, it's challenging. I mean, if this is one of the most challenging times we've seen in financial services. Uh, mm -hmm. But obviously unsecured being uh, a segment where the customer has basically used that loan for consumption. So he doesn't feel obligated, but if he's used the use to buy a home and he's living in that home, obviously he's gonna pay you. So if it's a home loan, then obviously the chances of the, of, of the money coming back are higher because you know he's occupying that home, he's, he wants his security. Uh, so it's very case by case uh, in, in how things are. But it, just because it is secure doesn't mean uh, there are no challenges. Okay, uh, so Nikhil, just a follow on that he wants to know from here is, uh, if multiple NBFCs and aggressive private banks uh, go under, are we looking at a contagion risk to the entire financial system? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a doomsday scenario. Uh, 
look i don't think uh, you know i don't i i may sound bearish but i may not be that bearish uh, <laughs> uh i don't think i don't think one should assume that the central bank and the government will allow this uh, you can expect maximum support i know i know the indian government so far has been disappointing people have been expecting more uh, but i don't i do think that sequentially the indian bank uh, will be indian banks will be able to uh, 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 i mean central bank and the government will come and sort of backstop a lot of uh, situations uh, where, so expect more government stimulus government support uh, to avoid uh, these uh, these kind of situations there will be marginal nbfcs which will not survive uh, and there will be so consolidation will happen in the industry uh, and there will be marginal sort of smaller banks that may need to raise capital uh, some may not be able to raise capital uh, so they might have to wait or they might have to shrink uh, or 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 look at m and a opportunities okay but uh, i look i don't think i i'm i'm hoping and i'm sort of uh, that i don't think we're getting we're going to get where you know large private banks go down under i don't think private banks are quite capitalized i think one thing different between this financial crisis and the 2000 other financial crisis is that private banks are quite capitalized uh, they have capital adequacy ratios upwards of 14 15% uh, so they can take quite a bit of losses and they have enough operating profits to book provisions uh, which they will use okay all right uh what kind of uh, packages do you or uh, what kind of stimulus from the government do you think needs to come in to uh, help a consumption led revival uh just helicopter money <laughs> <laughs> just drop dollars in everyone's bank account that's what the us is doing that's what the us uh, is that's, that's what, what singapore is doing that's what a lot of other uh, people that's what singapore is doing that's what hong kong is doing i think the government needs to support i, I mean rather than just giving liquidity support to banks because the banks never use the liquidity to support the businesses that actually need it because banks take commercial decisions right. uh so that liquidity money never reaches the the desired segments right so i think the government needs to come up with something for not for wall street but for main street yeah. uh uh where uh, it it you need to help people who are impacted you yes. need to help businesses that are impacted get perhaps some tips the universal basic income that we've been going around in circles about perhaps yeah, I mean, that has limitations because some people may not work after that right you make people un, you know unproductive that way uh, but at least people who need temporary support businesses which need uh, first loss guarantees for uh, support where you know banks may not be willing to lend on commercial grounds but rbi can come and sort of take the first loss guarantee so i think it is not possible given the enormity of this situation that central bank doesn't take credit risk uh so you will see central banks having to take some kind of credit risk it's happening all over i don't think india will be any different uh we will see have we central bank will have to use their balance sheet to print money for the government so that they can run wider fiscal deficits and provide a more meaningful stimulus and the central bank will have to take some credit risk because some businesses just need it. otherwise we let them go down okay state okay. of affairs yeah yeah we had a question that came in to us earlier gotham so will series a uh, series b rounds for bottom of the pyramid fintechs in the lending business be difficult to come by going forward and a related one to that is would it become difficult for fintechs that were focused on lending uh, for a consumption in the middle of the pyramid uh, will these companies survive i think we covered a little bit of that but for companies looking yeah. at so you need to differentiate between fintechs and fintechs if you're a lending fintech think of yourself as an nbfc unfortunately uh, and you will see challenges with fundraising if you are a if you manage to survive the cycle obviously you there'll be a lot of interest because you would demonstrate that you can survive this cycle and you're a survivor so i think investors will pick survival candidates in on the lending side and they'll wait to see who's actually fitting this or dealing with this better uh, so you would see some kind of delayed action there uh, so they need to find out who's the consolidator right if 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 there's consumer lending then there has to be one or two big consolidators 
Uh, so they will wait to see who actually emerges as a consolidator and that's where the money will flow. If you talk about other tech fintechs, right? Uh, API, you know, API services, infrastructure services, uh, other sort of infrastructure leg of fintech, right? Or which help banks in closing because now banks will have challenges with their branch banking, right? I mean, social distancing, you can't accommodate so many people. So there will be fintechs which will be useful for the banks to help them uh, sell digitally. Uh, so if you are an enabling fintech, it's a great time for you because now we're going to go from physical to digital, right? If physical to digital is gonna, was going to take five years, uh, it just got accelerated uh, post-COVID, right? So it's going to happen over the next one to two years. Uh, and that's a big opportunity. So if you're a infrastructure, fintech infrastructure enabling uh, uh, if those are your capabilities, then it's a great time for you. You should be going out there, trying to convince the banks, uh, trying to kind of convince uh, consumer tech companies to go the fintech way and, and make the most of it. Insurance? Insurance, insurance is interesting, obviously, uh, digital insurance. Uh, but my sense is insurance is, will be more interesting on the health and the protection side and less on the investment side. On the investment. Uh, because so far, the insurance industry has been more investment driven. Uh, and obviously people will now think about allocating their money carefully uh, on, on investments. Okay. Um, okay, back to the macros. Uh, so Nikhil, yes. uh, what, is the max, uh, what is the maximum fiscal deficit that the gov current government can go for? They have focused it, uh, okay. not, a, not an area who that, who knows? Who knows? Uh, you know, it's three and a half percent now, go to five, you know, that's where we started. Uh, for opposition, there's no, uh, there's no political, there's full political consensus on running a fiscal deficit. You've seen, you know, what Chidambaram has said. So expect them to take the opportunity. Uh, except that, you know, this government is quite socialistic. Uh, and so you will see them use the fiscal deficit to help the weaker sections. Uh, and uh, so the government may, may, may want to be more conservative so that they can use it over the next uh, few years rather than just use it in one go. Uh, so I think what you will see in India is not a big bazooka, but like sort of few mini bazookas. Okay. All right. Uh, where do you see valuations going in upcoming funding rounds for startups? Uh, fintechs, let's focus on the fintechs, but... Um, Look, VCs have more bargaining power. Where do you think the valuation will go? Yeah. I mean, that's mm -hmm. my unfortunate mm -hmm. candid response here. So I have a question that's come in from uh, Sunita. Uh, she'd like to know if there are opportunities or where do you see things going in the P2P lending space? Do you think that's something that uh, will pick up now from a fintech startup point of view? Yeah, so I think P2P has been challenging in the Indian context. Uh, you will see uh, uh, it's not, I don't think P2P kind of took off uh, before as well in, in, in versus the current context. Uh, essentially given that, you know, you need to create demand both ways. Uh, uh, also P2P is also very difficult to manage credit risk for the investor. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that P2P should, uh, I mean, I, in general lending will be challenging for the next few months. Uh, I don't think P2P would be any different. Okay. So if you have to think of, you know, uh, this is a demonetization moment of sorts. And I think the Philip over there went to payment uh, fintechs, right? Who could enable payments. And if you have to think of this as that sort of demonetization moment in the fintech space, one space that you spoke of that will do really well are the guys who are doing the underlying actual tech architecture, right? So the tech in the fintech, the guys who are actually building that base, good, strong technology to service large banks. What other spaces, uh, Gautam, do you see opportunities for? Yeah, so as I said, right, I think uh, neo banks sh should do well uh, because neo banks will help banks build a differentiated digital proposition. Uh, so I think anything which will make the financial services journey more digital from the physical branch. You know, you see how banking gets done in India, right? I mean, there are many times the banker comes home, home banking. Uh, all this is going to be challenging in the next, uh, as in this environment. So branch banking, home banking, all the kind of physical touch point related banking, uh, 
uh, or financial or any kind of digital distribution or any kind of distribution of financial services is going to be challenging. So anyone, any proposition, whether it's FinTech infrastructure, API services, uh, or kind of different helping banks build a new banking proposition uh, or independent new banking propositions, all of those segments are going to do really well. Uh, and uh, my sense is up until now we've seen, and I apologize to anyone who does FinTech lending, uh, I think up until now, a lot of FinTech has been about lending. Uh, I think it will move to FinTech services. Okay, all right. Uh, Gautam, in terms of just going back to uh, looking at the public markets, public markets and also asset allocation, right, from a point of view uh, as an investor, uh, where do you think, uh, you know, fixed deposit rates are going to go for instance? Uh, what's going to happen to real estate? If you had to just give us a sense of uh, what's going to happen in the next few quarters by the end of the year, if you're looking at someone is sitting on cash right now and wants to actually uh, start their investing uh, journey, how should they be playing the next few quarters? So I think gold will do well. Uh, and one could look at that as an asset class. Uh, I think uh, you will see fixed deposit rates go south drastically. Uh, you will see yields corporate yields will be challenging because credit risks will go up. So corporate bonds will not be very interesting uh, in this environment. Uh, so my sense is bank returns will go down. Gold will be a better asset class. It will be a great market for traders in the stock market because of the volatility. Uh, but it's going to be challenging from a uh, from a long-term investment deployment point of view. So one will have to pick, one will have to be very selective in the stock market by sort of selecting pockets and sectors which will do well over the long term, uh, which is sort of more covered proof or more sort of uh, looking beyond just the next one year. All right. Okay. Uh, I think we've gone through most of the questions. Just a last request for anyone who has any uh, questions for Gautam or anything that they would like to discuss over here. We can take that up now. And uh, otherwise, I have just a concluding note and we can uh, close this session. So just waiting for anyone to send in their question either on the chat or you could unmute your mic and uh, go ahead and ask Gautam a question directly. Hi, this is Rahul, Rahul from Med Delivery. I hope you can hear me. Yep. Yes, yes yeah, yeah, hi, Gautam. I joined late. So, but uh, there is this question that I have right now. So, I mean, uh, we are into B2B services and we know our end customers, those are actually shopkeepers. And uh, uh, this one part that is not our core business, but what we have figured out is actually we are facilitating this credit between these distributors and shopkeepers. So, let's say, I mean, uh, yeah. you are a good shop, we know your demand pattern, we know how you pay. Yeah. To us, right? So we actually uh, ask these distributors to actually allow you to credit for a certain limit and amount period, right? Uh, so, do you think I mean these this kind of service where actually banks and these other people do not know about uh, if they can facilitate this credit to this particular guy, right? But we know because of their demand patterns and etc., right? So should we focus on that particular area where we can actually? Uh, increase this portion of our business? Yeah, I mean, look, certain things won't change, right? I mean, the shopkeepers will remain. Uh, we will have to deal with them differently using digital. So if you're doing anything which digitally enables them and helps their business, it's quite critical to what they do, right? So I would say, obviously, you know your business better than, but I would say anything which helps them, which digitally enables physical touch points, is a good business, right? Because uh, you are kind of building it for the future. Yeah, so the question was only for like, uh, there are so many lending machines, but they can't lend it to everybody, right? And because they do not know certainly what, what is going on underneath, right? If somebody is actually asking for you to give, a, give you a loan, but we know that guy better because we are serving him from last 20 years, right? So, and we, we do this by providing a credit rating and then we actually increase the amount also based on month on month, right? So, and that actually has increased uh, a large portion. I mean, 30% is actually on credit to all of these shopkeepers right, from distributors now. Um, and before that, it was only 10% or so. So, do you think, I mean, these kind of facilities can increase and where we can actually 
pick up few other external parties those are actually into lending itself uh i think look i mean so long as your pipes are unique right and no one else does that people will find opportunities for you right be credit or anything else so i would just focus on making the distribution more differentiated and unique and then you will see multiple services uh, that come along uh, and sort of grow your business so i would just focus on the pipe uh, mm -hmm. which you are building uh, mm -hmm. and then i'm sure you will get many opportunities to do that but obviously if you do things which everyone else is doing then people will ask why how are you different so you have to think about that okay i got your point thank you great okay. thank you uh, so a macro question uh, from paras gautam uh, yeah. is there a macro economic risk when the indian government bonds rated bbb uh, fiscal deficit increasing obviously and the rupee going down won't fdi slow down and therefore the large vc capital uh, dry up uh I think VCs are quite capitalized, right? Because they raised big rounds recently. So the big VCs already have large funds which they are willing to deploy. I think the one difference between this crisis and the other crisis is that people were, people are quite capitalized this time. So everyone's just waiting to deploy and sort of uh, uh, and find opportunities. The uh, question is timing. So you may see some delay in terms of their appetite to deploy. uh but you may not see you will still see uh, that you know the capital doesn't dry up that easily obviously the soft bank kind of money looks challenging uh or anything of that sort uh but if local vcs are quite capitalized and they're looking to deploy i think that's where one should focus on all right or global vcs who have local presence hmm. okay and uh, lps uh, issuing note saying that uh, you know call to money might slow down not wanting to do is it just too much press not really because i think many of the high quality vcs have really high quality lps who have long term money so i i don't think uh, that's the situation all right and for angel investors early stage investors uh, gautam uh, certain uh, silver linings that you want to point out uh for them in terms of in a market like this uh and if they are looking to invest into early stage startups uh what are the silver linings from them uh i think uh i would say potentially uh i think it's a great time for digital right i mean this is essentially i mean we are working from home we are on a digital platform uh, so my sense is it's a great time to be a early stage tech investor uh except that you may have to pick and choose your trends uh so i i think anything digital right including fintech digital has accelerated what is challenging is risk uh which is balance sheet risk uh so long as one stays navigates that segment well uh i think anything in digital digital services uh or for that matter any kind of distribution businesses uh like if you look at now uh so i mean it was a food delivery business but now it's become actually a distribution business so markets and times are actually expanding uh so it's a great time actually to be a tech investor uh, if you see the segments in the market which are doing really well in the us is tech uh you know stocks are at all time highs despite this thanks a lot gautam for joining us today thanks a lot for your yeah. time and for patiently uh, taking us through all of this thanks a lot for joining us Great. thank you thank, thank you, you. thanks aina thanks for hosting me